And before we get started, of course, I just want to thank the people who made this uh, event possible, uh, to Dr. Bhatia of MIT, thank you for joining us, as well as uh, Cynthia Coons of Bloomberg, who will be moderating. And of course, I want to thank uh, Stephen Goodman and his firm, uh, Prior Cashman, for hosting us in this beautiful space. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn the floor over to our host, Steve. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I welcome you all to the space. You can see um, we love coming to work every day, so uh, I hope you're enjoying it. Um, for those of you who don't know Prior Cashman, we are a mid-size, primarily New York-based firm, about 160 lawyers. I am the co-head of the life science practice here. We have a number of small and mid-sized uh, life science companies as clients. The firm as a whole is a general practice firm. Um, we basically can serve as outside general counsel for all of the, the pretty much all the needs of those kinds of companies. Um, and uh, you know, we're very active in both sponsoring and helping uh, sponsoring events like this participating in the New York City biotech ecosystem. Um, I, uh, an angel group that I co-founded that focuses exclusively in life sciences, uh, sponsors a series of programs that some of you may be familiar with called First Pitch Life Science, where we give uh, nascent companies the opportunity to sort of practice their pitch before investors. And then instead of having to leave the room while they decide whether to do due diligence, um, we basically have the discussion while they sit in the front row and we sort of pick apart the business plan in a nice way. Um, uh, but it tends to be pretty educational. The next one of those is coming up in October. It's going to be over at uh, uh, NYU Langone. Um, and if anybody's interested, you can see me after the program and I can give you some more details. Um, I welcome you all. I think uh, this is going to be a fascinating discussion. Um, it's not an area I know that much about, but uh, I, you know, I have worked with some immuno-oncology companies, so I'm, I'm interested in seeing how those two uh, things uh, play, out, play out together. And uh, so I'll turn this back over to Joe, and again, welcome, and I hope we see you again. Actually, our event organizer, Nina Menendez, will be introducing the speakers for us. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Good evening, everyone. I am proud to be the newest board member of the MIT Enterprise Forum and to have organized this event. Um, our uh, a highlight of our evening is Dr. Sankita Bhatia, who is a current MIT professor and a uh, entrepreneur having launched a number of companies out of her lab. She is highly decorated. Um, she uh, uh, is the winner of the Lemelson MIT Prize for Innovation, the Heinz Medal for Groundbreaking Inventions, and Advocacy for Women in STEM Fields. She's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator, and she's an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Her work has been profiled in a number of media outlets, um, including um, Scientific American, the Boston Globe, Popular Science, Forbes, PBS, the Economist and MSNBC. Um, some of you will be interested to note that she is a uh, TED Talk speaker as well, and I highly encourage you, if you haven't already seen her tech, TED Talk, to go ahead and check that out, because I think she does a wonderful job of laying out her vision for cancer diagnostics. Um, our moderator for this evening is Cynthia Coons, who covers healthcare for Bloomberg. Among other things, she has chronicled the uh, collapse of Valiant and the continuing controversy around high-priced drugs. Um, she, prior to Bloomberg, she has uh, worked across the globe, actually, in Hong Kong and Sydney for the Wall Street Journal, and is focused on corporate mergers and acquisitions. Let me, uh, before I hand it over to them and, and get started, you know, we were in preparing for tonight, we were talking about 
who would be in the, in the audience? And one of the things that I said to Cynthia and to Sangeetha is that, well, with the Enterprise Forum, you never know. There's such a rich community that we draw from in the New York City area. You could have investors, entrepreneurs, you could have people from academic circles. It's, it's hard to know. So I'm curious as to who's in the audience. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd love to see a show of hands. How many of you in the audience are investors? Okay. How about entrepreneurs and startups? Okay, so about equal there. What about people from um, the healthcare industry? So pharma, biotech, device and diagnostics? <coughs> Legal, patents, sizable representation, and then uh, medical, so physicians, academics, students. Okay, a couple of folks. Is there, are there any other uh, kind of groups that I, I missed? <laughs> okay, sounds like I've covered it. Okay, great, so I think it's, it's as I promised, it's a very heterogeneous group. Okay, so, no further ado, Sakifa and Cynthia. Hi, good evening everyone. Um, I think for starters, uh, the TED Talk that Nina referenced was uh, really excellent and I think it might help to give everyone... Can't hear you. Okay. Um, the, the TED Talk that Nina had referenced was, was really excellent and I think it would help to give everyone kind of an understanding of what you're working on in your lab if you could start by telling us a little bit about the latest work you're doing and where things stand. In the sure, yeah. So hi, I am, as Nina said, I'm trained as an engineer and a physician, and my lab at MIT is in the Cancer Institute, in the Koch Institute. Half of every floor is engineers, and half of every floor are cancer biologists. And what I've been really inspired by is the miniaturization revolution in engineering. So you can fit a billion transistors where you used to be able to fit one, and that led to miniaturization and portability of computation. And so what we've been really interested in our group is how we can use miniaturized devices uh, to find cancer early when it's more treatable and then also to treat it better. Um, so we call this cancer nanomedicine um, and I do this in my lab and I also run a center um, at MIT of a collection of investigators. So amongst us we have about 200 trainees that work on this topic. So what type of cancers are you focused on specifically? Where have you had the greatest breakthroughs and see the most potential for this type of work? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think, um, so it turns out there's unfortunately lots to work on, uh, many, many choices. The, um, the National Cancer Institute has, has um, categorized a handful of cancers as the so-called recalcitrant cancers, the ones that unfortunately have a pretty dismal prognosis today. Um, and that we'd really like to prioritize. And so we work on those. Um, they include ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and glioblastoma, amongst others. And is nanotechnology applied in other disease areas yet as a diagnostic tool, or is this a completely novel approach? Yeah, so it's interesting. So nanotech so medicine, like I think many fields, rebrands itself all the time. <laughs> uh -huh. and, um, so there, there are older versions of what we now recognize as nanotechnology. So there are medicines out there that are packaged in little tiny particles called liposomes. So they're made of lipid fat um, already. Um, and some of them are used for cancer, some of them are used for infection. Um, and, and those came on the market actually in the 80s. Um, but uh, the US government has really prioritized cancer applications. Thank you. Um, cancer applications and so, um, so there's been a lot of growth over the last 10 years through the so-called National Nanotechnology Initiative in cancer specifically. And so I think um, as a community of investigators, we're sort of leading the pack. And you mentioned ovarian cancer, pancreatic. What, what area, which cancer have you made the most headway? What's the closest potential to market of all the work you're doing at this stage? Yeah. So we, inventors hate that question. Because <laughs> uh, we're always we try, always try to be careful, <laughs> and um, but uh, so uh, what I would say is um, 
in terms of areas of that have made the most progress, but not so much which kinds of cancer they're going to have the biggest wins in. I think we have made progress in early cancer detection, and I can tell you more about that. And then also, I think it was mentioned that there's an area called immuno-oncology, which is trying to turn the immune system onto cancer. Um, and there are ways to strengthen that battle with nanotechnologies. So I would say those are kind of the two areas that have been, um, been leading. Well, with immuno, if you'd like to start with that, with immuno-oncology, the ways that you're describing where you could potentially use nanotechnology to enhance some of what we're starting to see already, can you talk a little bit about what potential there is there, how that might work? Sure. It's a, it's a hard topic to start, start with, but bear with me. <laughs> okay. So, um, so the, uh, okay. So in terms of the length scale, so a human hair is about 100 microns. And so what we're talking about in this conversation are nanomaterials that are a thousand times more narrow, right? So 100 nanometers and smaller, so really tiny. And at that length scale, these materials can be injected in the bloodstream and circulate in the body. Um, and we know that when cancers start to grow, their blood vessels get leaky. And these tiny materials can get out of the blood vessel into the tumor. So that's kind of step number one. And then if you're an engineer, the question is like, what do you do with this little molecular machine once you've gotten in the tumor? So you could detect it, um, which I alluded to, or you could try and activate the immune system. Um, and in cancer immunotherapy, the, um, the, the actor is the T cell. It's one of the immune cells. And the problem has always been that um, we can't get all the T cells active in all patients. And so what they can do is make nanomaterials that activate the T cells. They call them T cell backpacks. Mm -hmm. And they bind on the surface of the T cell and they activate them more and then they can fight the cancer more effectively. But the basic premise is that you have a nanomaterial in the tumor and now you can either visualize it, get a signal from it, or use it to fight the tumor. Would you like her to repeat some of the stuff on immuno-oncology yes. since you lost some of it? Okay, sorry to make you do that, but just because oh, I fine. think that's... Quite Maybe I can explain it more succinctly. It's so hard. It's okay. okay, so the immune system is made of B cells and T cells. B cells make antibodies. They fight infections classically. And T cells kill other cells in your body. Kill cells that are infected with, with for example, HIV, as well as kill cancer cells. Um, and the trouble is that cancer is really good at hiding. Um, a cancer cell can look a lot like a normal cell. And so what immunotherapy is about, it is, about is getting T cells to recognize and kill cancer cells. And the trouble is that the T cells don't do that in all the patients that we like. And so what nanotechnology can do is to, they make, they make T cell backpacks. So they're little tiny nanomaterials that bind onto the surface of the T cell after the injection. And those little materials make growth factors that, that activate, stimulate those T cells to work better when they get in the tumor. And so in immuno-oncology, we would call this making a cold tumor, or one where the immune system is not working, hot. And making a hot tumor is sort of the name of the game right now. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, you, you also touched on um, the idea of early stage detection being yeah. one of the big areas. Um, can you also talk a bit about where you're at with that? What's what's in development and what, what the potential is there. Mm -hmm. So early stage detection is, um, is actually a remarkable opportunity and it's, it's a little bit unfortunate because the lion's share of the resources actually right now, um, the lot of, a lot of the excitement is focused on cancer therapy. Um, and and it, it makes sense, we're all excited about treatment and cures, but, but actually it turns out that two thirds of the cancer burden today um, could be alleviated through early detection and prevention. So, so if we could find the tumors sooner, then they would be much easier to treat. And if you look at ovarian cancer as a kind of a, a classic example of that, most patients present what we call show up with symptoms in advanced ovarian cancer, what we would call stage three or four. And the five-year survival rates are, are sort of single digits. But if you can find an ovarian cancer in stage one, when it's just a couple millimeters instead of a centimeter or bigger, those patients have a 90% survival rate. So it's a huge opportunity um, as a field. And as inventors, we've been really focused on that. 
Um, maybe in the discussion section later we can talk about um, how to make successful businesses out of early detection technologies because there's sort of a health economics issue around paying for, for, for diagnostics relative to therapeutics. But as inventors, there's a huge opportunity, and, and we think we have you know, an idea in our lab about how to do it with nanotechnology. Um, so so one, one question I had, I guess I had two questions around that, but to start, um, is the FDA doing much to promote this type of work and this type of early detection? Is there much reach out or engagement that might help push this sort of thing along, or are we not there yet? Yeah, so I think, um, so in cancer, the, the really the biggest, I would say, push comes from the National Institutes of Health, so the NIH, as well as other government agencies. The, in our experience, the FDA reacts to what they see, right? So they, um, if you send them new applications, then they have to react, and they are going through some change and innovation to try and react more quickly. Uh, but really, from an invention perspective, they're a little bit downstream. You have to have something that needs to enter patients, um, and they're there to preserve the safety of patients. So they're not really a great pull on the innovation side. It's really with research funding that, that you push that. And if you look at the National Cancer Institute budget, actually it's a tiny fraction, $60 million a year, that goes to early detection relative to their budget of $3 billion. So it's, it's actually quite small. Is that growing or shrinking, or is it status quo? Uh, I think, so there have been new monies that have come into nanotech, and the nanotech folks are interested in early detection. But it, it, I think, you know, therapies continue to attract the imagination of, of trainees and scientists. It's, it's really very compelling to think about how to treat a patient with cancer, and early detection is actually really hard. So you just think about why that's hard. So. Um, there's, I don't know if you guys have heard of, there's a, a famous cancer researcher named Bert Vogelstein. He's not at MIT, he's at Hopkins, but anyway. And he, he actually described the genetic progression of colon cancer, how we started a polyp and we accumulate mutations and how that turns into cancer. And so the, the progression of, of, of cancer in the gut is called the Vogelgram. Okay, that's like how amazing he is. And, and so he and I were sitting on a panel the other day talking about early detection, and he said, you know, the thing is, if you could come up with a therapy and you could treat 30% of the patients with advanced cancer, they would call you a hero. But if you came up with a technology that detected 30% of the patients with the cancer, then you're not specific enough, right? And, and that's the reality, because if you want to roll something out in the human population, you cannot have what we call false positives. Right, so it's a huge health economic burden if you're calling cancer when it's not there. So the bar for detection technologies is just inherently higher and it's harder, and all the inventors see that. Um, so, so, but we should still do it. <laughs> I think. That's one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about or ask a little bit about was sort of the, is there a sea change going on given some of the questions around the relevance of the PSA screening as an early diagnostic tool for prostate cancer, for example, or the role of mammograms in detecting breast cancer and how early or how much we should be using those. And it feels as though the conversation has shifted in the last few years away from what was a very pro-screening environment to more skepticism and concern about how the healthcare dollars are spent and if it's effective. And I'm, I was wondering if that affects the type of work you're doing or even the interest in people coming into it, coming out of school, who might be the people who you work with in the future of this? That's a great question. Yeah. So for those of you, um, just to sort of put that question in context, so PSA is the prostate-specific antigen, and it's, um, it's been a test that's had, you know, a really story history. Um, but, you know, the latest, the latest stance from the U.S. task force is it's been de-recommended as a screening tool. Um, and the reason why, um, actually, I should say to those of you in the audience, many physicians still do it. It's a perfectly good test. But the reason why it's not recommended for screening is that it can lead to false positives. So you can have a high PSA and not have prostate cancer. And that can lead to um, over-intervention. And so, um, you know, so the challenge in the field has been with, with screening technologies. And I think what we've learned is that even though screening is kind of the holy grail, so to speak, um, there are lots of places where 
detection or monitoring or early detection could be very effective without having to sort of saddle the technology with how would you do in the whole population, which is a very high bar. So I'll give you an example. So um, the new recommendation for patients who have a smoking history is that they should get low-dose CT scanned, um, so 10 pack years or more. And what's happening now is that those patients um, are getting, they're getting positive scans. And, and the positive scans are 95% of the time not cancer. And so they're showing up in clinic, they get a bronchoscopy biopsy. So it's a huge healthcare burden. So if you're a detection person, you think, actually, that's a really interesting opportunity to intervene, right? So there's a bunch of patients that have come in, false positives by imaging. What if you could do a test before they went to biopsy that could tell you whether they should progress in the pipeline or not? And so, so I think what's interesting as inventors is we're having to get smarter about where we point our technology, which is not historically the way we did it. And I'll tell you about the invention that we made for early cancer detection was not even for early cancer detection. <laughs> you know, it's not really how we invent is by like knowing about the healthcare economics. But we're having to start those, ask those questions kind of really early on so that we can do the right experiment to get the technology out there. So I think it makes um, the scientists have to be smarter, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but we have to be more pointed. And we're, we're in an environment where cost is central to the conversation about healthcare utilization. Um, and insurers are, increasingly discriminant in what they pay for. I know that's a little further down the track than maybe the work you're doing right now, but it is the end game and, and curious what the payer environment looks like in diagnostics, um, how the kind of hurdles look um, when compared with treatments and immuno-oncology breakthroughs and some of these very expensive drugs that are almost guaranteed to be covered. Um, just yeah. Yeah, so again, great question. So I think, um, so we have a little startup right now. It's a diagnostic startup, and it's a nanomaterial. And um, the way the nanomaterial works is it enters into the body, it goes inside the tumor, it makes a measurement, and it sends a signal out in the urine. So it's a urine test. So we were very excited about this because we thought we could do early detection, we could do it in urine, we could maybe do it at the point of care, it could democratize early detection, we could, you know, maybe even impact global health. We're all very excited. We started talking to investors about it and they said, okay, well, let me get this straight. So you've created an injectable nanomaterial, which the FDA will see at least in part as a drug. Um, and you are going to get reimbursed as a diagnostic. So you have, the perception is a billion dollar cost of development and the diagnostic upside in the 50 to 100 dollars. It's a horrible business process. <laughs> right. So that was where we started. <laughs> um, but we've evolved our story, and it turns out that we can get it to patients for $10 million, and we could actually get reimbursed as a drug because it's an injectable. And so we've had to be really very clever to, to because I think we have a transformative technology to map it to the healthcare economic landscape. So how close are you with that? Yeah, you, yeah that's a great about question. That. So, um, so the materials that, just to say a little bit more about them, so the materials that we created are um, about 50 nanometers. So I told you for about 100. Um, and they have on their surface um, little sensors. So basically chains of amino acids, bear with me, chains of amino acids that can be cut by enzymes that the tumor makes. So the, the material starts out with peptides on its surface, and when it encounters the tumor and the enzymes that the tumors make, the peptides get cut. And the little peptides that get cut come out in the urine. So when we do the urine, we find these synthetic peptides that should never be in your urine. That's the sign. And we make actually not just one flavor of these, 10 at once, right? And so we make a cocktail of 10 little nanomaterials. They measure 10 different enzymes. And that's the way that we can be very sensitive and very specific, right? So we won't have false positives. And so then it's a urine test. You can do the urine test on paper, or you could do the urine test in an uh, fancy instrument called a mass spec. Um, and so what we've done now is done, we did, in the lab, we did six different cancer proof points, ovarian, liver metastases, and so on. Um, and everyone said that's very exciting, but when will it get to patients? <laughs> um, so we started a company 18 months ago. It's called Glimpse File, like get a glimpse inside your body. 
and um, we spun it out in a little incubator at MIT. For those of you who haven't been to Cambridge in a while, Cambridge has changed. <laughs> um, and um, there, this little incubator is three blocks off campus. It feels all the world like MIT. Students love it there. I mean, they didn't have to change their address. <laughs> and um, and we are about, we will start human trials next year. Wow. Yeah. And which types of cancer does it detect? So those are business choices. Um, it's very interesting, actually. So this shows you like how naive inventors are. So I was the most excited about a version of the sensor that could detect the spread of cancer. So we were sort of talking earlier about how many lives you could save if you could detect cancer early. So if you could detect cancer very soon after it spread um, in the liver, where pancreatic, colon, and breast go, as a physician, I was really excited about that idea. And it turns out the imaging technologies can't detect things smaller than a centimeter. And our technology can detect about a millimeter. So we thought this would be very compelling to physicians. What you would do is cut out the piece of the liver that had the tumor in it, and the liver regenerates, and the patients would do better. And we know all of this information. So we went to, I had a team of business advisors, and MIT had great business advisors. Um, and they said, to me, this is a horrible idea. <laughs> And the reason is that if it's your lead product for a whole new technology platform, then the expense of the development depends on your clinical trial. Right? That's how expensive your clinical trial is, how long before you get to patients. And the clinical trial for an, a technology that is better than the current standard of care is actually very long. Because what does that mean? If I have a patient whose urine sample lights up, and no existing method today can detect it, then as a physician, I have to wait for that patient to present on imaging before I can score the clinical trial. Right? So you just bought yourself a multi-year clinical trial, and then you have to prove to the system that finding it earlier worked better, which we all presume is the case, but you still have to show it in data. So anyway, so we didn't choose liver metastases, and we published a beautiful paper on it last year in Nature, but, but <laughs> it's not for the company. So the company um, is working on two cancers and an obesity disease. The two cancers are liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, and lung cancer. And the obesity disease is called NASH, it's fatty liver disease. So, so some, I see some heads nodding, people are in the know. This is, um, now that I've told you about this, this will be like the yellow beetle, the yellow car. You'll see it everywhere. It's the stealth epidemic. Um, it's, it's, it's liver disease that's driven by high body mass index and type 2 diabetes. There's 40 million Americans at risk for it. It's the next biggest development pipeline after oncology and pharma. It's a huge, huge industry. And the problem is that right now it's diagnosed with a liver biopsy, which is a full day invasive procedure. Um, and so we're trying to make a test to replace the biopsy. So that actually will be our first lead product because we're replacing biopsy, which is a multi-thousand dollar test. Mm -hmm. It's safer, it's non-invasive, you can prescribe a drug if the test turns out positive so the payers will like it. <laughs> um, and then in the wake of that are the two cancers actually. So um, yeah, so we had to, you know, build, setting up a business is different than inventing. <laughs> Before we get there. Um, can you, since we're on the topic of staying a business, can you talk a little bit about the process of raising funds and how that was for you and how the market has been and in that mm. sense? Yeah, so I think um, I know most of you are alumni, I assume, right? Everyone's alumni. Some. Some. Okay, so those of you who are alumni, MIT is like the best place to invent something um, because you have um, monetary resources, so you can apply for incubator money. But the best thing is that you get advisors. Um, and so, uh, you know, a friend and colleague, Bob Langer, is two floors up from me. He's, he's actually on our board. Um, and then there's a, a center called the Dish Fonde Center, where you apply for the money, but it comes, the money, which is not very much, comes with advice. And that's the most important part. Um, and so for the, the two major companies slash babies, I call them like my third and fourth children, <laughs> that we started, we went to the Dish Fonde Center, and they helped us you know, the over the course of 18 months, actually, really work out the business model and what the raise would be and who the team should be. So for this project, we were in the midst of working out that, you know, they had said liver mass is a bad idea, let's look at some other markets. Um, and I was visiting 
uh, a friend and colleague that I met through MIT who is a woman named Kiran Muzumdar Shah. So for those of you who don't know, she's the CEO of Biocon, which is a, a large biopharmaceutical company in India. She's an amazing woman and a billionaire and a donor to MIT, and we had become friendly. And I was visiting her in Bangalore giving a lecture in her honor, and she said to me at the end, when are you going to start this company? I said, well, it's not quite ready. We're working with the advisor. It should just start. It's never going to be perfect. I will seed you. Um, and that became the beginning, actually. And then, um, you know, within four months, we had the seed round raised. Um, and so I, I tell that story just because I think, uh, especially for women entrepreneurs, sometimes it takes somebody to give you a little push and to believe in you. Um, and, um, and all the rest sort of flowed from that. And you raise an interesting issue that um, might be worth getting into as well, which is the issue of um, diversity in entrepreneurship and women going into entrepreneurship. And in your position, um, I'd be curious to hear what, what models you think have worked or examples of, of either companies or institutions that have done a good job about helping promote the role of women in entrepreneurship and what might be holding women, might be holding women back from moving forward with, with some of their ideas. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think so. First of all, the data are that about five percent of biotech companies are started by women. Right? So the numbers are, are um, and that's in spite of the fact that we've had fifty percent women PhDs in biology for twenty-five plus years. Right? So people say, "Oh, it's the pipeline." It's not the pipeline, <laughs> right? And so, so what is it? And I kind of, I, I sort of always ask this question kind of through my own lens, which is why, why did I start companies? I think some of it, anyway, is expectation, actually. So I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My, my dad is a serial entrepreneur. When I became a professor, he was disappointed. Um, he said, okay, <laughs> but when are you going to start a company? <laughs> um, and actually, he said, when are you going to start your first company? That was the question. So the expectate, the way I was raised, like, if you had an invention, you were supposed to bring it into the world. So I think part of it is orientation and expectation. Um, and then part of it at MIT, I think we have exposure um, to how it's done. You know, the really nuts and bolts, like you need a lawyer, you need a board, you need to know what's a patentable invention to file the patent in the first place. And so what I really think um, should be happening is that we should be exposing more women inventors to just, to just get calibrated, um, to get a sense for what is, what is a company? When do you have a company? and then how to go about sort of taking the next steps. Um, is there any taint or any um, any like follow-on effects in the market from what happened with Theranos last year and what role that may have played in changing perceptions about what is a disruptor and how legitimate people like yourself are who have been doing this kind of work in yeah. this field? So for those, those of you who don't know about Theranos, Theranos was a um, a diagnostic company, a so-called unicorn, um, started in the Silicon Valley tradition with um, a founder who was a dropout from Stanford, and um, and she was going to disrupt diagnostics. And so when I, I would say three years ago, started talking about how we were going to disrupt diagnostics, <laughs> we wanted to be a unicorn. Um, there was that was the absolute first, and I was a woman. It was the first comparison that everyone made, so much so that at the National Academy of Engineering, the year I got inducted, they put us on stage together. <laughs> and Elizabeth Holmes, um, you know, she uh, doesn't have any degrees in engineering. And so I had to get on stage back to back with her. Um, and I was thinking, like, how am I going to resonate with what she says <laughs> in this sort of, you know, in the hallowed halls of the National Academy? And I was thinking, like, just give me some. She came up with no slides. All dressed in black, the whole thing, and, and um, anyway, at the very end, she said, "Women need more role models in engineering." And I was like, "Oh, that's that's my that's my ticket." So I got up and, and I gave yeah. a very deep, detailed um, technical talk to the engineers. And so in the beginning, I had to contrast myself with her a lot, just to say, like, I have degrees, we have papers, we have publications, you know, to legitimize our work. The good news is the landscape has actually changed completely because now there is Grail. So for those of you who don't know, Grail is a liquid biopsy company. It's an early detection company um, detecting cell-free nucleic acid citrine, so nucleic acids in the blood. Um, and they've raised $1.1 billion. Um, and so now what people say is, can you be Grail-like? 
um, not so much are you Theranos? You know, and the answer to the Grail question is absolutely yes. So, the, so thankfully, the conversation has turned. Can Can you talk a, a little more about liquid biopsies and how that may revolutionize things, or where your technology may sit alongside that, or differentiate from from that? Sure. Yeah. Form of detection. Yeah, so, so cancer is, um, at least uh, in part, a genetic disease where mutations happen inside a cell and then the cells are able to grow and invade unchecked. And some of those cells will die and go into the circulation. Um, and when they're detected in the circulation, we call those circulating tumor cells. So a couple years ago, circulating tumor cells were kind of all the rage. Um, everyone was really excited about taking a blood sample and detecting these tumor cells and seeing in them what the mutations are and then being able to prescribe the appropriate medicine. We call that precision medicine. Um, to fast forward, to, so that turns out to be exciting but hard. Um, and it turns out the reason it's hard is that you can't control what the cancer sheds, right? So not all of the cells that are relevant for your genetic test necessarily end up in the circulation. So that's why it's hard. Um, so fast forward a couple years, so now people are saying, well, it turns out that this not just the whole live cell is in the circulation, but its DNA contents can be found in the circulation. So people call those cell-free nucleic acids. Um, and they're not around for very long. They actually degrade really quickly in the blood, but we've gotten so good at DNA sequencing that we can, we can do single molecule detection, so we can detect things really sensitively. So Illumina, which is a big player in this space, made a big investment in seeing whether we could find cell-free nucleic acids um, in blood um, and longitudinal studies as early detection. So it's, it's a, they raise a lot of money. It's what I would think of as an exciting 10-year experiment. Um, we're we're going to see what they find. Um, in mice, you can find, in some cases, you can find those mutations. Um, the Bert Vogelstein problem is still the case, so lots of cancers are present in which there are not nucleic acids, so that's kind of the challenge. The way we think our technology is different, they have a billion dollars to figure it out, so they will find something. <laughs> um, the way our technology is different is that our nanomaterials go into tumor and they make a measurement that we already know is important in the cancer biology. So we don't wait, we don't sit and wait and collect blood, five liters of blood where the signal is diluted. Um, and look for it. So it's, we think it's a sort of fundamentally different um, approach. But you know, I can imagine a day where they would sit in a chain together. Maybe you would do our test first and say, yes, you have an aggressive tumor. And then you would do their test to say, this is the mutation. And then you would pick out the medicine. So you know, I think there's going to be room for everybody. Now, coming, coming back to the topic of immuno-oncology, um, there have been a few setbacks in the field recently. I, I'm curious where you think things are at in the development of immuno-oncology, if this is the natural course of there had been a lot of excitement, there were some big early discoveries and, and big wins, and now we're seeing how broadly applicable it may be or may not be. Um, but curious to see how just your thoughts in terms of, of how this is unfolding and where you think the next um, big thing might be in oncology, if you have any thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah, so I think immuno-oncology is absolutely going through the normal course of biotech. I mean, if we look back in time and we look at monoclonal antibodies, it was the same thing. Right? So there was a wave of excitement, then there were some safety issues, everyone sort of regrouped, went back to the lab, sorted it out, and now here we go, it's you know, as big as drug therapy. Gene therapy, lots of excitement, very prominent death in 1986. Everyone went back to the lab, found alternate vectors. Here we are again on the cusp of gene therapy. Um, RNA interference, lots of excitement, Nobel Prize, a couple prominent deaths. Um, you know, here we are potentially on the cusp of you know the, the first approval last year, and maybe now um, with Alnila, maybe the second approval. So, so all of these things have these waves. I think that you know, you know, oncology is absolutely in the same space. So I think they will get through it. Um, but I do think that they're not, it's, it's, it's only just one of the latest things. Right? I actually still really think we need to get medicines that exist today more focused on the tumor. Um, and so I'm still really um, excited about the potential for nanotechnology to do some of those things. 
The other thing that we've been working on, which is related, um, are is what's called synthetic biology. Have people heard of that? There's some, some nods. So synthetic biology is used to describe when you re-engineer a living organism, typically a bacterium. I mean, one thing that we did last year was take a, a probiotic, so E. coli that normally lives in your gut, and re-engineer it to make chemotherapy so that you would take it. The, the press called this the cancer the, the, the cancer yogurt project. <laughs> <laughs> so you could ingest it, it can find its way into the tumor, and it could make chemotherapy on site inside the tumor. So from a side effect profile, right, you're, o you're attacking the cells of interest first and, and sparing all the normal tissues. So, you know, we did that on animals, um, but we were really excited about it, and we're working, there's a couple startups in Cambridge that we're working with to sort of take that forward. So I think immunology is exciting. Um, it, it's, it's compelling for lots of reasons, using the immune system to keep your body in check, which is what it should be doing. But I think there's actually more coming. Now, the, the landscape in, in cancer and, and development is often dominated by the large institutions. Um, curious if, and, and, and also the large companies, big pharma has become, I mean, cancer is the whole story these days in terms of drug development. I'm curious what advice you might give the audience here as to where to find, how to look for good opportunities, how to sort of feel them out, and where else to look um, in, the, in the broader landscape and find some of the really smart science that's being developed. Yeah, I, I'm not an investor, um, but I, I, I think it's all about the people. So you, you, know, you find those kind of points of light and then find out what they're doing. So just to give a non-MIT example, there's an investigator named Wendell Lim out of UCSF who's making smart T cells. So he's using that synthetic biology approach that I told you about in engineering T cells. I mean, it's a fantastic approach. And you know, I could make, I could give you a list of my top five, but I think you know, pick the great institutions here in town where it's all carrying. Obviously, MIT. Um, <laughs> but and and um, and see what's coming out. Uh, call them up. I get people all the time just saying, coming around, saying, "What's new?" Oh, interesting. I'd like to open it up and see what sort of questions the audience may have at this point. Any question? Yes, uh, very interesting presentation. It's a very very complex field. Uh, I have a few questions, but I'll try to limit them. One is just in, in your product in particular, is the FDA going to make you do trials on each of the six or seven variations uh, of the uh, nanoparticles that you're producing? Um, second, you know, you, well, you know, I, I certainly see you know, opportunity for this kind of detection for metastases of known, which have known tumor. Um, but do we really have an idea of what happens to early metastases? How many of them actually live? And at what size do they have to get to before we know they're going to live? And uh, I had a third well, I'll, I'll leave it for a second. Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. So I'll take the second question first and then talk about the regulatory. So I think um, you touched on a really important point with broadly in cancer, actually, which is when should a tumor be actionable? Right? Because it, it is actually the case, probably, that we all have malignant transformations. We all have cancer cells at some point, and the immune system can get rid of them. Right? It's only when they start to grow in an unchecked way that we should intervene. Right. We know that prostate cancer is a great example of in a subset of patients you could live your whole life with prostate cancer. Um, so you shouldn't intervene in every case. So what our sort of scientific approach has been to pick a stage of metastasis which is called the angiogenic switch, which is when tumors get larger than a millimeter, they change their state to recruit more blood vessels, and we take that as a sign of badness. Um, and so that's what we point our technology at. So that's kind of how we've made that decision. The FDA, we are, we are just talking to the FDA now. Um, and, uh, and, and we're talking to them in a very focused way about the first product, which will have 10 probes in it. And um, they, they have been actually really open to a dialogue of handling the formulation all as one regulatory path. 
The other conversation that we will start with them, which will be interesting, I hope, is once we get the first product through people and we show it's safe, can they start to let us think about it as a platform technology? Do we actually have to, every different version of it that we come, is there any kind of accelerated safety schedule that we could do um, to be able to get more quickly into patients after the first one? Um, so that will be a second gen conversation. For now, we're just starting with the first formulation. Well, I just thought of my third question, which is, you know, there are uh, kind of two sides in uh, you know, looking at cancer. The, uh, the cancer type people versus the pathway people. And where do you stand and why? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so um, what's being alluded to is that there's so there's some drugs now. Actually, the first drug that just got approved, which is which is one of the first ones, which is mutation specific. We used to think about cancer as cell of origin specific, right? So we would say there are three different kinds of breast cancer, and so on, right? But but now people are saying, well, actually, if you have this mutation, you should be able to use this drug against it, no matter what the cell of origin is, no matter what tissue it's in. So it's a different way of thinking about cancer is more genetic and less, less site of origin. Um, we are kind of in the middle, actually, um, because what we're really listening in on is the invasion of cancer. So the enzymes that, that we, our sensors detect, um, detect when cells break out of their tissue. Um, and they eat the scaffolding around them, the extracellular matrix. And so um, there are some that are tissue type specific, and we pick those for certain cancers, and some that are across all cancers. Um, so, so we're sort of in the middle. I actually have three questions to which I'll try to be really fast. This is fascinating. The first is, um, why, do you have any sense about why some people's T cells are inherently stronger than others. The second is as somebody who has a mutation, um, when you look at like ovarian cancer or colon cancer, which are known to kill young, um, is there an economic case for less invasive use of the kinds of work that you're doing on those populations of people that are starting testing like colon cancer patients get started testing at 15. Yeah. I know that. And the last one is you as a role model, when you look at the women in your lab, that you've taken them from scientist to entrepreneur, what do you see that you're naturally breeding mm. as a new class of, you know, because science, you know, you said, your father said, shit, why are you a professor? You should have been an entrepreneur. <laughs> did and I say that? Did I no, say that? you didn't say that. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, it's your kind of, no, I'm sorry to talk about you. You're a hybrid, and do you think by being a hybrid, you can breed hybrids? Yeah, those are, those are all great questions. So the first question on T-cells is, you know, honestly, it's, it's a whole field. And I, I speculate, but, but I think there really are not There's not an answer. Great answer. There's a lot of research going on. This is the sort of $60,000 question on the moment. Um, the second question that you asked about whether certain high-risk populations can help with the economic use case um, is really. a great one. And it's been proposed to me. So I think um, we've looked at, for example, in, in BRCA1, which is a, a <coughs> mutation with them, um, where you can be at risk for breast cancer and ovarian <coughs> cancer, where, where maybe you could make a case that you should surveil patients during a time in their life when they want to do fertility sparing. So you want to keep your ovaries, you're willing to get tested every six months because you're thinking about starting a family, it's not forever, I mean it's a focused period of your life. Can you make a case around that? And we've actually looked at that. Um, it's probably not enough to stand up the whole diagnostic, but it would be, you could do a clinical trial like that. Um, and then you would focused. already, yeah, because it's focused, and, 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 and patients would, and now, and you need enough patients to actually have cancer in that time period, right, for your trial to be viable. So, so the actual economics around that trial work, and then you would so-called broaden the label later. So I think that is a very interesting kind of work around use case. The third question around role modeling is, I have to say, um, I have never had a woman student become an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, and it drives me crazy. 
um, and you know, so this is something I'm really thinking hard about because I um, am sitting in the middle of Cambridge. I'm educating, you know, a lot of women. I have two amazing women entrepreneur colleagues, Paula Hammond and Angie Belcher, are just rock stars. Uh, Paula Hammond was the first African American head of a department. Angie Belcher was a MacArthur fellow. They're both entrepreneurs. The three of us are like, what? <laughs> what can we do? I think you have to inject them. <laughs> 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 Nanomaterial. That's it. <laughs> it's an, an entrepreneur. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> so you talked about nanodiagnostics. To what uh, extent are those applicable to nanotherapeutics, where you could be a Trojan horse and you could deliver and treat cancers, like you talked about? Yeah, that's a great question. They're absolutely relevant. So we have papers on on all of those. Um, and, and, then, and then you enter into like, which one of those do you push out of the lab? So we have uh, activated by that enzyme. We have an imaging agents that are activated. We have nucleic acid delivery, which is activated. Um, we have drugs that are activated. Um, so, so I think all of those ideas are actually viable. Um, the cancer therapy space is crowded. Um, and, uh, and there are big dollars, but it's a little bit fickle. Um, so, so we haven't entered into the fray. We've actually been, we've had a technology that's a couple years old where we've been, I said, okay, I don't want to do a startup, I just want to license it. Um, and I still think that's actually the right play for the technology, but the immuno-oncology is so loud right now <laughs> that nobody wants to hear about nucleic acid delivery. And CRISPR is changing things um, because genome editing is you know, the next wave, but gene, not so much genome editing yet in cancer. So how close is the science to reality in that context of therapeutics, uh, nano therapeutic studies, just generally uh, globally? Yeah, so the science is, is actually really, um, as I'll say, as good as it can be for cancer. Um, and what I mean by that is you may have heard you know, the story about how you can cure cancer in a mice, you know, a hundred different ways, right? And so, so the status of nanomedicine is that most of them have been in mice, um, and we're just now seeing a wave in patients, and it's gonna, it's gonna bear out over the next three to five years. So we're on the cusp, but we don't have the hard phase three trials yet to say, like, kind of, we deserve to be here. I actually don't have a question. I just ap want to apologize for having to leave early. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you for coming. In your diagnostic concepts, uh, how small a tumor, how small a mass do you need in a mouse before you can detect it? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in uh, ovarian cancer and in liver metastases, we detect one millimeter lesions. In a liver metastasis? In a liver metastasis. But they also have a primary or not? So these are mouse models of liver meds. So we create them and then we take out the primary. Um, and then just focus on the metastases because if we let the primary grow, then it would get too big and it would swamp the thing. So they only have one liver met, or they have fifty. Yeah, so so, so we can detect um, in ovarian and liver. Ovarian grows as what's called miliary disease, so it's still yeah, I small. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, in both of those, we can detect one to two millimeter lesions with an aggregate burden of about forty cubic millimeters. So it's not a single lesion; it's still several lesions. So you're taking about a centimeter and a half of the tumor. Yes. Yeah. Over this, the whole. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to get a concept for in your primary detection systems, you're talking about it takes a centimeter and a half, and it's already a large breast cancer in a way. Yeah, so in the primary systems, though, we've done those measurements um, with the primary tumors and not the METs, um, and those we can detect sub five millimeters. So I would say that's where the cutoff is at the moment. Your mammograms are. Sensitive is that better? Yeah, uh, but I don't think that, you know, I don't think that mammogram actually is a place to start. For I'm that just trying to compare your technology to existing ones. Exactly. Sure, yeah. You know, so what we've, done, what we've done is picked, picked tumor types that where there's not good imaging and then gone against the blood biomarker. Uh, yeah, and so in all those cases we can beat the blood biomarker, which, you know, but none of those are very good right now. So, um, yeah, that's where we are for hepatocellular carcinoma. You know, we're better than ASP, which is not very good, <laughs> and ultrasound, which is the current method. But pretty better than an MRI scan. No, right. But I think, but we can do it on more people, 
Right, so that's the issue. Yeah. On ovarian cancer, uh, what's the timeline difference between peritoneal spread versus slitterments? And does that come into play at all? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, with regard to ovarian cancer, once you have peritoneal spread um, versus, so that, that would be local spread versus distal spread, that's the difference between stage three and four, so they're both considered advanced. Um, our detector, you know, it's actually really hard to connect mouse experiments to humans, but we try. Um, and we, we think our detector is about, you know, in the ovarian use case, it's about six to 12 months sooner. So it's not, we haven't solved the whole problem. But you know we're pushing back and we're getting smarter about it all the time. So the latest version that we have is a nanomaterial that doesn't just leak out of the vessel, but it's what we call targeted. So on the surface, it has um, it has chemistries that will attach to the tumor and concentrate there, and that makes it another about tenfold more concentrated. So you know once you have a system, you can start to engineer it more and more, and we think that that's probably an advantage over just sort of waiting and listening in the blood. Um, because we can we can be smarter about what we're delivering and get more of it there. So what is the uh, science uh, behind the safety side effects and the safety of these nanomaterials itself in terms of, you know, these are nano tiny particles yeah. that could incorporate itself and itself lead to mutations and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a whole field called nanomaterial toxicology. There was about a five-year period where I ran a nanomaterial toxicology core at MIT. And the city of Cambridge, being kind of unique, was one of the few city, two cities in the country um, that had actually regulated nanomaterial waste. <laughs> uh, being from an from environmental perspective and from a worker exposure perspective, yeah. actually. Um, and of course, you know, sort of the history of this is asbestos is essentially a nanomaterial, right? And so, so there's this this. Um, there's science around the idea that the size and shape of materials in different parts of your body that don't degrade can react in unexpected ways over very long time scales. So what do we do about it? Um, so, so we have a whole cast safety cascade that we put through materials, through novel materials. Our very practical approach for this particular project is to choose materials that have been in people for 20 years. Um, and they're only nano because we put peptide decorations on them that have also been people. Um, and they degrade, so they don't hang around for a long time. But um, but there are other groups that use novel nanomaterials, things like quantum dots and other things, and carbon nanotubes is another great example. And that they have a higher safety burden because we don't have long safety data on those component parts. So how does FDA sort of review data around all of this? Yeah, so the, the National Nanotech Initiative works with a special office of the FDA that in a lab called the Nano Characterization Lab, and they recommend a series of assays that you're supposed to do if you have a new material. Um, and they include kind of all the regular things that you would do if you were a chemical or a drug, and some extra stuff um, around blood interaction, around long-term reproductive toxicity, around inhaled exposure. Question in the back. Hi. Um, tumor heterogeneity. Does, yes. Does nanotechnology, do you think, address that? In other words, it occurs to me that you could have a situation where the nanotechnology would destroy 95% of the tumor cells because of their unique profiles, but the 5% that survive would be potentially worse than the entire tumor. I, I don't know if those questions are, are being addressed. Yeah, so that's a great question. So tumor, for those of you who don't know, so tumor heterogeneity is the idea that every cell in the tumor is not the same. Some, um, they accumulate different mutations. People think of it kind of like an evolutionary tree um, with a trunk. So that might be like what we call a trunk mutation. And then your genome is unstable and you start to accumulate more and more. So if we then look at a tumor and you look at all the cells in the tumor, they actually are different from each other. Um, and they have different sensitivities to anything to drugs, to radiation, to immunotherapy, and to nanotechnology. So the tumor heterogeneity problem, if it's focused at uh, the genetics, is not any different. Um, if you're looking at something downstream, which is invasion that is universal to all the cells, then you actually have the potential to overcome some of that. 
Um, and so that's kind of what our idea is, that we're downstream of, doesn't matter how you got invasive, we still want to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea. But the ability of, of a particular type of cell to use, in other words, can you formulate the nanotechnology or, or the payload or whatever it is in a way that can assure you that all of those cells will be destroyed? You can detect them, as I understand it, yeah. the, the technology that you're describing. But the next step is therapeutics. Yeah, so I think I, the, so. I think in the therapeutics, it's the same. So you can do combinations. So the combination idea comes from, basically from antibiotics, right? We know that um, if you give one drug in HIV, then you get resistance. But if you give three drugs, you get a nice chronic therapy, and you don't see much resistance, right? So you're attack basically attacking three ways that the virus can escape, and so all all three doors are shut. You're able to keep the virus in check. So that same idea sort of pervades cancer research. Um, in the nanotherapy world, in the chemotherapy world, even in the immunotherapy world. Um, and so I think that can help. Um, there is still this idea that there are more resistant cells in tumors, the so-called cancer stem cells. Um, and I don't think that we can say for sure kind of what the magic word is for those cells. Which is why it's better to prevent. <laughs> Question. Have you considered alternate markets to the U.S. for product launch? I, for example, in Europe, uh, some medical devices have a lower regulatory burden there. Yeah, we have thought a lot about that. Um, we haven't so much thought about Europe. So just to dig in a little bit, so we have this drug injectable device, diagnostic drug device combination, and we've asked the FDA to look at it as a combination, but to regulate it as a device because we think the diagnostic is what we call the mechanism of action, right? Ultimately, it's making a diagnosis. Is that a lower bar? It's a lower bar. It's cheaper in theory. We'll see. <laughs> um, and it's actually, they're very used to, to sort of regulating classifiers, right? Right. That's what this is. Um, so that, that's the argument that we've made. Europe is um, really no better on the combination front per se, but in terms of market, actually, China, um, is much bigger for liver cancer and lung cancer um, than the U.S. So um, I think a partnership in that space is something that we're doing. India? You know, India is a tough market, as, you know, as fond as I am of it, as in the Indian region, um, is a tough market to start in uh, for, for lots of reasons. Even if you have, like, so much of this here, cedar? <laughs> yeah, I, th I think, you know, it's not an integrated system. System. Yeah, and they don't honor all um, so it's tricky. China's tricky too with um, with counterfeiting, um, but I think enough people have been there that we we know how to. Um, there are at least some folks who have understood how to get into that market and, and protect the technology. But I, I mean, I don't know yet. I'm just getting started. So if anybody knows how to get into India, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> Did you know? Any more? Mm -hmm. This may be an aside, but um, general observation, it seems like a lot of high profile people that we hear about, have, you see the big announcement they have cancer, I think most recent is Senator McCain, but it seems like they come out of it quickly and I keep thinking, hey, something's going on in the general field of cancer. I can think of Carter and all, a whole bunch of them that and you get a big announcement, the next thing you know, they're right back. They're right back. Am I making any sense? It seems like there's a drug or something going on. <laughs> you know, yeah. That's working very well for at least those people. I don't think they have the same type of cancer. Well. Yeah, well, so I guess what I think what you're observing, which is um, that some high profile patients seem to have a really favorable, surprisingly favorable course based yeah. relative to our perception. I think that's actually a system of, a symptom of cancer research is moving really fast right now. And what that means is that the advances are, are really concentrated in a handful of centers. Um, and so it's actually a moment in time which is really exaggerating healthcare disparities. Um, and uh, I hope it's temporary, but it, it's, it's very visible to all of us. The care you get today is going to be different at Memorial Sloan Kettering than it is going to be in the community oncology 
Um, it's absolutely, um, and that's because you'll get you'll get sequence, you'll get access, you'll get on a clinical trial, all of those things. So I think that's what you're seeing actually. It's just a moment in time where the field is changing really fast. Um, and I would say it's actually um, there's even more work to do beyond healthcare disparities in the U.S., which is that globally, um, you know, up to 70% of the cancer burden is actually in low middle income communities where there is no screening program. In Sub-Saharan Africa, there's one oncologist per five million people. 18% of patients have radiation access. You know, so, so if you think about the cancer burden globally, it, it's it's actually a, a, a diagnosis you know, in some settings is, is much more lethal than it is here. Okay. Yeah. Are you aware of a parallel technique that you can Yeah, so, so actually, yeah, the question was, do we, are there other things that work on a drop of blood akin to Theranos that, um, that, yeah, that, that, that maybe have more science around them? <laughs> so I, I, you know, actually, this is a whole field. So there's, um, there's, a, there's a meeting every year called the Lab on a Drop, Lab on a Drop field, um, where people look at how much you can measure in a drop of blood. And so, so there are many super sensitive technologies. One out of Cambridge is called Quantera. It's a single molecule company. Um, the, the trick is, so you can measure things super sensitively. The issue with a drop of blood is actually twofold. And it has to do with how much the drop of blood from the part of the body that you measure it in is representative of the system. So that's one problem. And then there's a sensitivity problem. So many companies have solved the sensitivity problem. You know, which is how sensitively can you measure something in the drop. The biology problem of how well does the drop represent the system is something that's being worked on. So for example, there are technologies that um, work on um, what's called electrophoresis, so using electric fields to pull out more fluid um, in sort of like a bandage type format. Um, than, than, a, than a single drop of blood. And the thought is, at least for diabetics, for example, that that might be more representative than a single drop of blood. So, so the single drop of blood is, is, is a cool idea, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not confident that um, it's relevant for all diseases. But you intravenous more representative, or we do a Sure, oh, absolutely, yeah, it's just, it's just a larger volume, yeah. On the pricing, of uh, these drugs. There was an article in the Times today that uh, uh, the cost of developing the, these drugs are a lot less than we've been led to believe. And do you anticipate um, uh, kind of a blowback that um, you know, government is going to eventually try to push the price of drugs down? Right now, the pricing model sort of is you know, a little hard drug. Uh, does better than your current therapies that cost half a million dollars, so we'll you know, charge 475000 Yeah, for the car keys. Yeah, so I think, um, I think, you know, we need to make healthcare delivery more cost effective as a nation. And medicines are part of that, for sure. Uh, actually, I think healthcare delivery is broken in a lot of other ways, um, where there are healthcare savings. So I think that high price medicines are a piece of the puzzle, but not all of the puzzle. Yeah. Uh, how does CRISPR fit in the nanotechnology field? Yeah, that's a great question. So for those of you who don't know, CRISPR is a technology um, It was discovered in, um, in bacteria. Um, it's a way to edit the genome. So the way I heard it described is like if you have a Microsoft Word document um, and you have like the little editor bar, it's like it's like enzymatically placing that editor in the human genome and making a cut. Um, and when you make a cut, you can um, damage the gene that you cut, or you can put something in um, to replace a damaged gene. Right. So it's it's editing the genome. And um, there's lots of excitement about it. There's at least three major startup companies in it. Um, 
there's an MIT professor who was really a pioneer in the field named Fang Zheng, who's a collaborator of ours. And um, they're the first set of technologies in CRISPR really that are, I think, on the forefront are not in cancer. They are in the areas of the body where you can get delivery of this big enzyme, which is called CRISPR, and the RNA template, which helps you figure out where in the genome to guide it. And that's the liver, the eye, the muscle. And those are all relatively accessible places to genome edit. Um, cancer is lagging, um, and it's because of tumor heterogeneity. Right? So, so in order to have an effective CRISPR treatment, for cancer in the tumor cells, you need to get in all the tumor cells. And most delivery technologies on any day of the week don't get in all the tumor cells. So then you say, okay, well then what if I get 90% each time, I could deliver it every week, then maybe eventually I would get there. So that's kind of where we are, um, and we're still kind of in mouse experiments. So we have experiments like that going on where we have really great target genes, and we think they're CRISPR candidates. And then the question is just, you know, can you beat time? How fast are the cells dividing? How fast can you kill them? 90% each time. So I think um, the jury's out. I'm sure someone will figure out a clever way. Um, in our center, we have at least two people working on it. Um, so this has been uh, fascinating. So I'm curious to know when you're your top five. You might have mentioned the Bible and then you started to go into a few other names of lights of people to follow. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. My top five. Oh, I don't know if I can do it on the spot. <laughs> I have to think about it. Um, yeah, I have to think about it. I'll, pick you, I'll give you five MIT professors. That are maybe all my center. Daryl Irvin, Paula Hammond, Angie Belcher, me, Bob Langer. That's it. Top five. <laughs> MIT focus list. There's a question in the back. Yeah. design the actual materials are, it's actually, because the National Cancer Institute has invested so much in cancer research, it's an amazing time to be a cancer researcher because you can go to what's called the Cancer Genome Atlas and look up the mutations in human tumors um, of almost any kind. So what we would do in the lab is nominate a tumor, ovarian cancer, and go and look up which of the 550 enzymes that we know how to make sensors against are um, up or down in the brain cancer. And then we would delete a whole bunch that would be what we call background. So if they also exist in inflammation or infection or other tumor types, then we would delete them from the list. We would come up, we would nominate a list of ovarian cancer proteases, enzymes, that we could make sensors against. So then we build the sensors. So we make a polymer core that can degrade with time. It's made out of polyethylene glycol, which is a FDA approved material, it's been around a long time, and it's been in people forever. And um, we couple on its surface the peptides that, this, that those enzymes will cut, and those are known in the literature. Um, we, so we do a chemical reaction, and we make a 15 nanometer material. And we test it in the lab to make sure they detect the enzymes, and we make, put 10 of them together, and then we would go into a, a mouse model of that disease and see how sensitive it would be. Um, and then we iterate. So sometimes, you know, we thought we were so smart that there was some background that we didn't measure. Or the RNA level, which is what the Cancer Genome Atlas gives you, is not the same as the protein level for the activity of the enzyme. So it's just sort of overly optimistic. And then we choose a different one. Um, and then we come up with kind of our final formulation. Mm -hmm. Question in the back. You had mentioned a while ago uh, obesity, and then also uh, you had mentioned preventative care. And so, how does one's own management of health care affect all of this? To what extent is cancer a direct result of not managing properly? 
Yeah, that's, that's an important question. So in terms of cancer prevention, I would say what we know today about cancer prevention is there are two cancer vaccines, hepatitis B, which is for liver cancer, and human papillomavirus, HPV, which is cervical cancer. Um, those are amazing vaccines, and they work, <laughs> and they prevent cancer. And then smoking cessation, right? So those are the three main things that we can do. On top of that, there's screening, colonoscopy, mammogram, pap smear. And then on top of that, there is now an association with high BMI. You know, the science of that actually, we're still figuring out as a community. It's, it's, it's quite clear in the liver that it predisposes to what's called NASH, fatty liver disease, and liver cancer. But there are other kinds of cancers that have a higher incidence in obesity where we don't understand yet the causal relationship. So the recommendations coming down from the NCI are we manage your BMI, but we don't know yet all the cause and effect. Hmm? And don't smoke. Yeah. Can you give us an idea of the order of magnitude of the cost of this test? I know we talked about low cost diagnostics before. Is this a ten dollar test, a hundred dollar test, a thousand dollar test? With the understanding that Pricing of these things is incredibly complicated. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'll give you the business answer. Um, the, the inventor answer is I can make it, I invented it, I can make it as cheap as I want, actually. And so for the global oncology application, where I don't have to be so sensitive, because we're not competing, sadly, with screening technologies, patients present much later, I can make a readout on paper, I can make those very cheap. Um, for the company, to stand up a business, we have to price it below biopsy, which is a couple thousand dollars, but higher than imaging, right, which is a couple hundred dollars. Okay. So our business models are between those two numbers. <laughs> so you mentioned the stats on you know, prevention versus cure, uh, how in cancer prevention it's much more effective but still, um, the bar is much higher. Um, are there federal dollars going in that direction? Because in the long term, it will come out cheaper and given a long term curve on a cost, um, NIH and all those. And then, uh, are you seeing movement in that direction which will promote more focus on prevention versus Yeah, you know, sadly, it's really underinvested in, even at the federal level. It, so the, the, the dollars are $60 million of the NCI $3 billion budget. It goes into what's called the Early Detection Research Network. It's, it's just really underinvested in. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. I could talk to you all night about why, but um, that's, that's a good matter. It's underinvested, it's underinvestigated. Under-reimbursed by insurance. Under-reimbursed, all of it. And I'm still yes. doing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Probably> crazy. <laughs> I had a quick question. Are there, do you envision any direct-to-patient opportunities for this? Or given that it's an injectable, do you need a healthcare provider somewhere in the process to actually implement this test? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so again, so you know, so MIT students are super creative. We have a bunch of versions of this that don't require an injection at all. So, for example, the lung cancer one is an inhaled delivery. So it's like a, we envision it like a puff. Um, and I've already told you that the urine test can be a paper readout. We have another one which um, which queries patients that are at risk for a month of some disease. And so the, the, the publication that we wrote was about, imagine somebody's been discharged from the hospital and they're at risk for an infection or a blood clot. So you would give them a shot, it would sit kind of under the skin, like a, kind of like a TV bubble in the old days. Um, and then we would send you home with a pack of paper tests, and we would pee on one every other day and call us you know, if it lit up. So I think there's a lot of ways to think about um, really kind of democratizing the readout. The issue, of course, always, which is what 23 and Me got into, is that you have to inform patients, right? So um, you, need to, you need to give information in the context of the healthcare system. When you talk to practitioners, is there a lot of excitement about this or a lot of caution, like given some of these issues? Yeah, I, you know, I think the market is now flipping. I mean, when I started talking about this, so I, you know, having trained as a physician, I had some 
think they cut me some slack <laughs> in the beginning, but I think they thought I was this crazy MIT inventor. Um, and so the first thing that we did was map it to something that physicians know, because I think this is, um, this is how they think, right? It was this something that we do today um, is much easier than thinking of a whole new paradigm. So the something that they do today is actually, there is a, there's something called a PET scan, which is an imaging scan, where you, you give a contrast agent, it's radioactive, um, and it's a form of sugar, of glucose. Um, you give the contrast agent and then you do a PET scan, and you see where glucose metabolism is elevated. This is commonly done, for example, for cancer. And once we were able to say, you know, this is just the same. We're giving an agent and we're making a measurement. It's just that you're used to giving an agent and doing an imaging scan, and we're giving an agent and doing a urine test. Once we were sort of like able to make that connection, physicians were much more kind of amenable. And now, you know, fast forward four years, um, you know, Google has been talking about a smartwatch that can detect nanoparticles in your bloodstream. I think the sort of the, the consciousness of the of the of the community has evolved so that now I think they're quite open to it. Yeah, I mean you'd think the drug companies would be really excited about this because in a way it can more effectively uh, impact the use of their drugs, really. Yeah, absolutely. So so um, if you are making today, if you're making a drug for Nash and there's forty 40 drugs in the pipeline, so lots of people are, um, and, and you do your financial modeling, you say, oh, I have 40 million Americans that I might be able to treat, and you say, okay, everybody who comes on my drug needs to get a liver biopsy, um, you would screech to a halt because there's 30,000 liver biopsies you, right, because it's a painful, sometimes dangerous, full day procedure done by a specialist under anesthesia, right. So they absolutely, to get to their market, they need something else than biopsy. So, so I think at the moment, they're absolutely um, you know, our biggest pull. Mm -hmm. How about lung cancer? Because it's so late stage detection. Yeah, so, so we have an application in lung cancer, which is this inhaled version. That sounds so exciting. We're excited about it. I think, you know, there are a lot of people chasing the lung cancer market, so we have lots of company. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we think that there are some dimensions in which we'll, we can win, like I said, in a chain. So we can't provide the mutational information. And lung cancer is one of these areas where actually there are some drugs that really are better if you get mutational status. So I don't think we would be the last test, but we could be the first test. And that's what I'm talking yeah. about, is to avoid the false positives that are the majority of them are yeah. false positives, right? Is that correct? That's correct. So 95% of low dose CTs are false positive. Right. That's false positive. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then also, and again, thinking about the global landscape, so 300 million lung cancer patients in China. Right. So, yeah. so, um, so that's you know almost our population. 